We're not going to believe what came in yesterday. Okay, spoiler alert, this belonged to Admiral Carl Dernitz. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the man, but most of all, I want to talk about what walked in because it is so amazing. It was just like a, a very special day here at Legacy. So the mail comes in and a box about yay big comes in. I have no knowledge of this box. I open it up and I pull this out of the box. I see the plaque, which I uh, obviously can't read, and I open it up, and here is a baton. Now, I'm thinking, what in the world? Where'd this come from, and how come I didn't know about it? So I called Kurt, uh, meaning I yelled upstairs, Kurt, do you know anything about this? And he said, yeah, that's uh, uh, Carl Dernitz's baton, uh, but it's a replica. I'm like, oh, okay, good enough. But then I read this. Well, let me, let's take a closer look and I wanna tell you a little bit about this because it's more than just a replica. Well, let's get the suspense out of the way and I'll just start off by saying this is an original copy of the original. And this inscription pretty much explains it all. Uh, loosely translated, it says, to our respected Grand Admiral, on the day of your release from prison and to replace the lost symbol of your high standing from the officers and men of the German U-boat service, Berlin, Spandau, that Spandau prison, October 1st, 1956. So all of that explains that. Karl Dernitz had a baton. Here's a picture of him holding it. It was presented to him by Adolf Hitler when he became the Grand Admiral and that was in January of 1943. That baton was taken from him when he surrendered, and he was then sent to jail for 10 years. So in 1956, on October 1st, he was released, there it is right here, from Spandau Prison, and his men had this made up as a replica of the original and presented it to him upon his release from prison. So. What a piece of history, and certainly more than just saying, eh, it's just a replica. Um, and this is the inside of the case. Uh, it's wood underneath here, and this is pretty well, uh, pretty ornate. Uh, also, I did use a blue light throughout. There is no synthetic fabrics uh, on, on this. And let's pull out the baton. I'm using white gloves, in this case, uh, very necessary. Now. Uh, there's an inscription. This would be the top. There's a, a, a swastika. And by the way, the original looks exactly like this. The original is in a British museum. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the original, I'm told, although I can't tell for sure from pictures, the original was tw uh, plated in 24 karat gold. This is brass. Very ornate. Um, and then the inscription here, if we just take a look at this, it's from the Fuhrer, and it is uh, to the Grand Admiral Dernitz. Uh, then we see this blue felt and this very ornate uh, symbols, along with Navy, Iron Cross, and of course the uh, uh, Nazi Eagle. And that goes this full length. It's fairly heavy, and by the way, it's empty inside, although there is a screw when you tighten this up. The screw runs all the way through the middle down to this end. And there's an inscription here. Before I get to that, this is exactly like the original. It has a U-boat. And uh, the inscription at the bottom, loosely translated, basically it was presented um, on January of 1943. And that's when Rader, Admiral Rader, was replaced by Carl Dernitz. Um, the other thing about Dernitz that's important, and I just did a short, a short is basically a 60-second teaser, and I said, who succeeded Hitler after his suicide? And the answer is Karl Dernitz. A lot of people get that wrong. They assume uh, some other well-known name, such as Goering or Himmler or Goebbels. But in fact, uh, in his final will and testament, Hitler appointed Dernitz 
to be the head of the German people. He wasn't the Fuhrer, he was uh, called the president, and he took power on May 1st, and he signed the surrender on May 7th, and it became official on May 8th. This uh, inscription is loosely translated, uh, for the freedom fight of January 1943 from all the people of Germany. So that's the loosely translated. So let's back up a little bit. Um, first of all, how do I know this is the original? I, I can't say for sure other than the inscription. Uh, this has been documented that the, the, the men of the U-boat service did present him with a replica because his was taken. There's a couple stories about how his was taken. Uh, one story, and, and of course everything on the internet is true, except when they contradict each other. I did read a story that said he was captured by British troops, which he was, and they captured the original baton. And in fact, the original baton is now in a British museum. So we have pictures of him being captured. We have pictures of him with the baton. Uh, we know that Hitler had batons made up. Hitler did not have a baton himself, but as far as I know, he did not have a baton. But he gave them to all of the military leaders. All the field marshals got a baton, very similar to this, but you see Red felt, you see green felt, you see blue felt. Uh, you also see a lot of replicas. Now the replicas are easy to spot because if you look at the pictures, they're shiny and new. And uh, the, the blue felt looks like your grandma's rug. It looks, it looks like a carpet rather than um, a, a nice felt. Uh, they sell for about 600 bucks. So Rommel, for example, had one. Uh, so the field marshals got one. And famously, Goering got one, which the baton is just a symbol of authority. It's not a weapon to hit people over the head. It's a symbol of authority. And my best guess is that goes all the way back to, actually in ancient Egypt, they had a scepter. Uh, actually in the Old Testament, it says that God carries a scepter on his holy throne. Julius Caesar and the other emperors of the uh, Roman Empire, they held sepulchers as as uh, symbols of their power. And that carried all the way through history uh, to the European armies around the world, including the Russians, the, the British, the French. On my background reading on this, it says that basically they carried a baton as a symbol of their power. And Hitler had these made up. They were paid for by the state. Uh, and by the way, I did read a story that the 101st found uh, some of these not given away, not yet given away. If you look here, this little strip, this laurel leaf is part of the, of the bronze engraving. The, the chain is part of the bronze engraving. But this strip is a different color and added on. So my best guess is they had, uh, Hitler had these ordered up, and I was told there was three of them uh, found by the 101st. This is the same. And all they have to do is take this piece of this strip if there was a new field marshal, say in 44 or 45, then they could take one of these and just add that strip. So that's, that's how these were made up, and some were made up in advance. Now going back to these, um, there are several people that said that Dernitz had two of them. I don't know that for a fact. I know that the original that was taken from him is in a British museum. I know that uh, Goering's was in the West Point Museum. There's a picture of it here. Uh, he had two. The first one he had had kind of a, a greenish color to the uh, felt, and that one was given to him in 1938. And evidently that wasn't good enough because in 1940 he got a second one, which is a lot more ornate. Let's take a look at the second one had a, a white uh, tube. I don't know if that's felt or not, but the white tube. And if we look at the ends and actually uh, throughout, throughout the entire baton, it's diamond encrusted. And if you look at the Luftwaffe uh, symbol, eagle, diamond encrusted. So he got a second one. And I started to say that uh, a lot of them didn't walk around with this, but Goering was famous for his uh, being ostentatious or flamboyant. And so he would walk around with this diamond encrusted baton and with his beautiful white uniform and everybody could see, I guess they did the baton to match his uniform. But everybody could see that he was in charge. He was large and in charge. Now, this second baton that was given to him by Hitler, at that time, it, it cost, not in today's dollars, at that time, 
it cost $130,000 to have made up. I'm sure today it would be just the value without the historical value is got to be a half a million dollars. And most of the field marshals didn't get anything that ornate. I would assume they got something more like this. But again, this is brass, not gold. Uh, this was paid for by the men of the U-boat service. They, yes, they had reunions. Dernitz was imprisoned for 10 years. Interestingly, uh, Dernitz, unlike a lot of the war criminals, he was not sentenced to death because in many cases he disobeyed orders uh, from the higher ups, including Hitler. Uh, so for example, uh, I know somebody who was in correspondence was with Dernitz while he was still alive uh, because he had a ancestor who was part Jewish and in the German Navy. Dernitz protected him from being sent to a concentration camp and lobbied to keep several uh, Jewish or partially Jewish officers in the Navy. The Navy was also the, the last of the armed forces that put the swastika on their flag. And they also disobeyed orders, uh, and this has been well documented, that they disobeyed orders to shoot. When the U-boats sunk transport ships, especially troop transports, they would not shoot uh, people in the water. They would also often leave them to fend for themselves, so I, I can't say they were uh, exceptionally kind, uh, but they also refused to shoot people uh, who were in the water. So while he wouldn't get Humanitarian of the Year Award, I do believe he wasn't your typical Nazi, and that's one of the reasons that after be, being sentenced to prison, several U.S. and British naval officers lobbied and wrote on his behalf asking for clemency. So he did get out a little bit early, and when he got out, he was met by his men and presented with this original copy of the original. Very, very cool part of history, and I am so honored that somebody, unbeknownst to me, without my knowledge, this just showed up one day. And you thought you had a good job. Just imagine it. Okay, this is one accessory that I think is as exciting as any gun I have. So... Uh, I do get a lot of questions. People are going to say, Tom, are you going to keep it? Uh, the answer is no, and maybe someday it'll come back to me. But I, um, I mentioned a collector who had personal correspondence with Dernitz, and he has personal items that belong to Dernitz, and they became, I'll call it pen pals, over the years. Uh, and I am going to uh, send this off to him, and he will own it, uh, happily own it. And like I said, maybe someday it'll come uh, back to me. But this, you will not see it for sale on our site, but only available by watching our channel. So make sure you like and subscribe to see beautiful treasures like this.